to finish the day before Murray's going to do a little bit of a um, uh, roundup of uh, his, uh, his impression of the day. Um, and there has been some general agreement that maybe um, pulling together some notes might, might be good and we could talk a bit about how, how we might do that and who might con contribute to, to that. Uh, so, but first of all, let's listen to Greg. Uh, he's going to talk a bit about implications for farm, farm profits. Greg is uh, uh, currently in the upper, up in the mid-north, aren't you? With, yep, uh, in Clare. Uh, yep, yeah, with the South Australian no-till farming people. And uh, that's where I run into him at field days on the other on occasion. And I see here that he is a graduate of the University of Adelaide. Uh, with honours in organic chemistry, so Ron would be very pleased with that. And uh, I'd like to welcome you, Greg, and look forward to your talk. Thank no you. worries. Okay, um, I guess I'm just going to try to hopefully put yourself into some farm issues today and look at some general options from a carbon constrained economy. So it's not just all soil, but uh, certainly soil makes a big part of it. Okay, so when we look at the opportunities under the Carbon Farming Initiative, there's a whole lot of things we have to do under regulation, and you can't have impacts on surface water and you have to offset water use of carbon plantings and all those sort of things. So there's a, there's a whole lot of issues there with regard to biodiversity. So it's not as easy as just going out and whacking in a whole lot of trees or anything like that. As well, one other regulation I just want to briefly mention here too is that wheat is about 43% carbon biatomic weight. So there's over a tonne and a half of CO2 in every tonne of wheat, but not allowed to claim that. Okay? It's, it's ruled as being transient meaning that it comes from in the atmosphere and after it's eaten it goes back to the atmosphere. However, uh, biofuels and carbon for sequestration under a carbon constrained economy will get a financial advantage by having its carbon from the atmosphere uh, having a, pr a value to it, whereas the, uh, the carbon in the food has no value, which is probably a little bit inconsistent with someone eating a whole loaf of bread, throwing a half a loaf of bread in the, in the bin and having no, I guess, uh, obligation to, to offset any of that carbon compared to someone who eats not a lot. So. Um, in a carbon, in a farming sense, the biggest source of, of carbon actually leaving the farm is actually in, in the wheat or in the products that are leaving. However, we can't pass on the emissions that go into growing a crop out through that mechanism. It's just simply not allowed. Um, the other one that I want to talk on about is the market forces. So what are people willing to pay for? And we'll look at relative CO2 emissions. So different gases, and say for example methane, nitrous oxide and carbon dioxide have different warming potentials in the atmosphere. So they have what's called a different CO2 equivalent. You may have heard that methane is about 21 times more powerful than carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide is about 300 times more powerful. Another issue I'm just going to touch on as well is avoided emissions versus carbon sequestration. And there's a, there's a big difference there because sequestration, you've basically got to keep the carbon for 100 years and a lot of landowners don't want to enter into 100 year contracts, whereas when you avoid emissions is basically you're pocketing the, uh, the difference straight away and there's really no ongoing liability. The market, so there's Australian carbon credit units and Kyoto units. Even though Australian carbon credit units are going to be supported by the Australian government for the next three years, at some stage that support will stop and then the market demand for those products will spread. So we would expect that Australian carbon credit units will be worth about one-tenth of what a Kyoto unit would be worth. And the underlying reason for that is that companies under the carbon tax that have to offset their Kyoto obligations can only do that using Kyoto certified emissions reductions or sequestration, they can't use soil carbon to do that, not in, at the moment. Okay? Soil carbon, be it in the form of biochar or soil organic carbon, is an Australian carbon credit unit. And so if you look at, say, a Kyoto price of, say, $25 a tonne, expect once the government support washes out in a couple of years, for soil carbon maybe to worth, be worth $2.50 a tonne. I mean, who knows what it's going to be, but because people can't actually off use that to offset the code obligations, the market for that is going to be voluntary. So pharmaceutical company, a bank, people with really not a lot of emissions but want to look good in the marketplace and they just won't pay for it probably. And also the other one is the underlying demand relative to cash. And if you sell your carbon, an interesting question we're working through at the moment, is carbon going to inflate in price and value at the same rate as cash is? We've got a lot of um, economic turmoil, people are printing money in the world at the moment and with a fixed natural resource base, if you increase the amount of cash, you get inflation and so we'd expect a fair bit of inflationary pressure over the next few years, decades, 
however long we keep running with this monetary system and is carbon going to inflate at the same rate? And that's a pretty important decision for a landholder when you're making an investment. Is it actually going to keep up with money? Because if you make it goes from $25 to $26, you made about 4%, but if money's inflating at a higher rate than that, you're actually slipping behind. Um, the other one is the production risk and the price risk. So as carbon, if you have a production risk, so can you actually build up this carbon? But say you take 20 years to build up the soil carbon and you've been selling it during that period, and then there's a price differential. So for example, let's say the price does go up and due to a drought or some circumstances even outside of your own control, your soil carbon goes down, how are you going to go out to the market and fulfil your obligations? And if the price of the carbon has changed, you also have a price risk associated with that and that's burnt a lot of people in the deregulation of the grain market. Okay, so people are really wary of what we call a price risk. Um, and the practicality, you've probably heard a bit today about you know, the land tenure, that growers don't really want to have these 100 year contracts, the modelling or measurement debate. And so there's not a lot of certainty in, in all of those things and none of that even gets to the whole point of you know, sharks in the market and, uh, and that type of unsavoury stuff either. So just to give you an idea, if we were to have sequestered sea, uh, soil organic carbon, and there's no current methodology so you can't do this as easy just yet, but what's the relative market value going to be over the next X amount of years? Let's say it's one tenth of the Kyoto value of say for example avoided nitrous oxide. The greenhouse CO2 equivalent, one to 300 in rough terms. So the relative market value is one to 3,000. And here you've got a 100 year liability and here you've got a seven year project. So when you look at that and you say, well, the value and the risks in that, there's a clear differential there and until the dust settles and we know exactly what we're dealing with, I'm not sure that you know, we'd be advising our members to go and rush out and start tying up their assets um, in soil organic carbon for a return and perhaps we're better to look at other niche markets like fertiliser use for a larger return for a, for a smaller change in practice perhaps. All right, so there is something that's really easy for us which is the conservation tillage refund tax offset. So instead of having to deal in all the measurement and verification, this is simply from a period in time, it's over three financial years. If a farmer goes out and buys an eligible machine to do less soil disturbance, they get to write an extra 15% off the depreciation effectively. Okay? So there's no liabilities, there's no risk, they may be of going to be buying the machine anyway. And so it's a really smooth transaction, if that makes sense. And that's why we think that's something that as an organisation we want to try to help facilitate. Okay. The other one I mentioned about was energy. And if you look at um, the sustainability of food energy, Hunter-gatherers used to actually put out about one joule of energy to collect ten, so getting up and going and picking a berry off the bush or whatever, or netting a wild animal, which is a bit harder, but everyone got to have a feast. Compared to post-industrial, by the time you add up the amount of energy that goes into mining the fertiliser or making the fertiliser through the Haber process, which is very energy intensive, uh, just distribution of all of that, the actual machinery and the embodied energy that goes into making the farm machinery, the modern farm machinery, the fuel consumption, all of that sort of stuff, the processing of that wheat into flour, into bread, and the sale of that, you're looking at about one joule of food energy for about 10 joules of fossil fuel. And I guess that's sort of just a washout of the age of, of cheap fuel. Um, but the world energy outlook is pretty much pretty clear that the, uh, the age of cheap fuel is over and we need to look at energy efficiencies, renewable fuels and all that sort of thing. And once again, comparing that to soil carbon, producing renewable energy is a very simple transaction. You either have it or you don't, and if you're selling it, it's either being metered through an electric meter or being sold in litres through a diesel tanker or something like that. So at the moment, um, renewable fuels like, say for example, diesels, biodiesel or renewable diesels that are made, uh, I'm not a big fan of first, first generation biofuels at all. Uh, there is some circumstances where they're okay, but second generation biofuels are very interesting, I think and where people can now basically sell those fuels and get the whole 38 cents tax rebate, uh, the excise back as well makes that pretty attractive. So when we look at energy efficiency, and just before I go on, I'm about to just cover a few technologies pretty quickly, and I guess that's a reflection of both 
the Stern Review and the Garno Review, which said that there's no one silver bullet. So I'm not going to stand up here and talk in depth about one big thing, because there is no one big thing. It's about incrementals of lots of different things adding to a better, bigger picture. So on farm efficiency, GPS, those people don't know about it, but basically a, a tractor these days can be driven to about 10 centimetre accuracy, 2 centimetre accuracy, auto steered, so the driver, he's just sitting there listening to some music or whatever and turning some corners, but it, it's, it has given us energy efficiency. Um, UniSA was working uh, a while ago on this project, and this was modelled out on a, um, a 3,000 hectare cereal farm on the, on the York Peninsula. And uh, you can see basically, if you can imagine that when your header fills up, you need to empty it. Okay, so it's full of grain, you need to empty it. If you're going along and yielding a two tonne crop, it's going to fill up at a different time than if you're getting a three tonne crop. So where you put your bins that you're going to empty into has an influence on how far you have to drive. Now your header is the biggest limitation in harvest. It uses the most fuel and when you're not cutting crop, you've got downtime. So having your header drive somewhere to unload and drive back is fuel consumption as well as a major inefficiency. So using spatial software effectively to say we are expecting this sort of crop and that's being verified through a yield monitor, can we in fact lay out the way we harvest the paddock, the direction we take, where we put our different infrastructure, where our semis are going to load, can give us a, an efficiency increase and I guess over that particular over that particular crop, the time of harvest was reduced by 73 hours. The last two to three years at harvest time, not so much this year, but in previous last few harvests, we've had a lot of rain at harvest, which leads to price downgrades. Okay, it gets wet and spoilt and things like that. And so time in itself, being able to harvest quickly, is an adaptation me mechanism to, to climate change. But also the fuel use was about 1,660 litres. But also when you're doing less hours on a header, headers are sold not by kilometres done like you would like a car or a motorbike, they're sold on hours that are done. So keeping your hours lower has other benefits in terms of resale value, maintenance costs and labour savings and things like that. Okay, there is something in different, um, in different systems. Uh, generally speaking, some of the results show we use uh, a bit less fuel in an ungrazed system, and I guess that's just the soil is a little bit softer there. And between different types of seeding systems, we see some, um, some different uh, fuel use. And one thing we're trying to focus on, I guess, is that when people, before they buy a new machine, have an understanding of how to wield that machine as best they can. And just to give you an example here, the best way to use a disc seeder is to have the tangent at 45 degrees to the soil surface. That'll optimise the stubble cutting and the, and the penetration and those sort of technical things. You see here we're too shallow, we're not in the soil deep enough, and if stubble gets caught under here that's where it can start to hairpin and you can have poor seed placement and things like that. Whereas here we're too deep and we'll actually start pushing and they call it bullnosing the soil, but that'll use a lot more fuel. Okay? So just seeing if we can use the equipment that we have as best as possible. Design is also a really good thing. Designing things well can save a lot of energy and a lot of fuel. And if you look at this, what's called a coulter here, which cuts into the soil, it's radial based. So from the centre, we go straight out to the edges. Okay, so those flutes are actually straight out from the centre to the edge. And you can see when that's going into the soil, it's actually the, the side of the corrugation that's going to press into the soil. It's actually not the blade. Okay, so that doesn't press into the soil anywhere near as efficiently. And if we look at this, what's called a tangential coulter, you notice these aren't radial from the centre. They're actually at a different angle altogether. And when it's coming into the soil surface, it's actually the, the front of the steel, if you like, that's cutting in. So you imagine trying to get a bit of galvanised iron and press it into sand. It's pretty easy. Put the galvanised iron on, the, on sort of 45 degree and press it in. It's really hard. So once again, you know, can we get efficiencies just out of good design because to forge that with the, with the heat that's required to forge it and to make it and distribute it is no more than the heat required to forge and to make and distribute that one. So design can really help us out as well. Okay, just bear with me, but this is a new technology we've been working on for about two or, two or so, three years now. And it's actually the use of ultra high pressure water. We're talking things about 50,000 PSI. 
um, uses a low volume of water because the orifice that it comes out is very small. And we think this has got a, a, a quite a few benefits. And I just quickly want to show you a video here that I have prepared. I think it's going to be a bit loud, though. So I'll just try to turn that down a bit. And this is a 10 power orifice at 40,000 PSI. Right, now, the, that's okay. You all right? The 10 power orifice at 40,000 PSI at 1,000 feet a minute goes deep. I guess the idea is, the idea that that's, um, it cuts stuff and pretty well. So, a thousand feet a minute is about 18 k's an hour, so that's about the same speed that a, a spray rig would work at. Um, uh, no, no, that's, uh, everyone's probably got it, it's all good. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, and, and just, oh, it's from current slide, oh yeah, thank you. So, the idea with that was, is um, can we actually, with, you know, it obviously takes energy to make water pressure, but could we design and make something that would actually cut better into soils? And I've got plenty of photos of it and pictures of it going through soil, but you just don't see anything. That's only why I show you that one. Um, but it's been the fastest growing industrial tool about the last seven years running, and it's replaced mechanical cutting and everything from steel, paper, food, you name it, it's, it's overtaken mechanical cutting. And we cut a lot of stuff in agriculture, so the feeling was, well, wh why can't perhaps we use it? And the, the first idea, you can see there, maybe that looks like the front of a, you know, that's actually for cutting paper, but the point is you've got multiple heads going along, and could we make something like a coulter instead of using a metal blade? Could we actually inject liquid fertiliser as the cutting medium, so not use water, use a liquid fertiliser as the cutting medium, clear the stubble, get a furrow, and... Also, in, high, in crops that have high fertiliser demand but a small seeds like canola, you can get desiccation at times. So there's, you know, particularly if it gets a bit wet and then dries out, is that the granule is, can start to desiccate it, whereas we sort of have a feeling that by having a big spread of the fertiliser, we're less likely to see desiccation. And just to give you some ideas, this is a six tonne equivalent stubble load laid directly across the grain of, of our cutting direction, which is probably the worst case scenario. And you can see it's just, you know, it's just ripped through that, no worries. In clay soils, we often with this seedings get what they call smearing, which you imagine a clay and, and smearing it, it gets really, you know, shiny and smooth. And that can have a whole lot of issues with seed establishment and water and things like that. As you notice there, you might be able to see there's like a slight rake angle cut through there but there's no smearing or anything like that. So we really like that. And as you can see, it cuts through the soil, no dramas. That's the sort of, um, that's, to me, that's actually the, the fertiliser being injected. But to me, it almost looks like a root system, doesn't it? You know, in terms of what the profile of that looks like. And here, we've got our cutting depth. So that's where our nozzle was, down to here, through the stubble to the soil surface and then into the soil. And penetrating into the soil a couple of inches really isn't that big a deal. Moving at you know, 15, 18 kilometres an hour. And the hope is, is that we, we think we can do that within water rates of 80 litres per hectare to about 220 litres per hectare, which is within the range of what people would use spraying now, maybe a fraction higher at the 220. But horsepower is, looks okay. But the other big benefit we're trying to look for in terms of carbon and all the rest of it, emissions and, and energy, is embodied energy. Is the only reason people are running dual tyres and triple tyres is because they're dragging all this crap through the ground. So what if we're not dragging anything and everything's out of the ground? Can we use single tyres and save embodied energy? Do we need 8 mil steel frames all welded together or can we use a much lighter material? And so, so it's not necessarily about the energy use in actual operation, but trying to save embodied energy. And if we move to singles, does things like soil compaction and organic carbon, you know, what's the flow on effect of that? So, yeah. The other, the other thing about it is potentially using it in crop to deliver nitrogen. This is a small trial. This is actually a mechanical slasher that we're guiding with what's called an ecodan. It's basically an infrared sensor that, that uh, determines where the crop row is, locks onto it, so you can put something down the interrow without slashing all the plants. So this is a six-inch interrow, 
Okay, so that's actually a pretty tight spacing. This guy is an organic farmer, so he doesn't really have a lot of herbicide options, so he's quite keen as a cooperator. So we've got these little blades that are spinning around as, as like a whippersnipper, if you like, and it's being guided. It actually works okay. The only reason we used that was just, this is about mechanical crop safety, but the hope is, can we actually inject a liquid? Because there's a reasonable amount of literature around that suggests if you can actually put your nitrogen below your main band of soil organic carbon activity, is that you can reduce your nitri nitrous oxide output. So by delivering it into a depot where the roots can get it but the microbes aren't in such high demand, perhaps there's some savings there. The other thing too is this is a soil moisture trace and some of you might not have seen it before so I'll just really quickly run through it. We have a trace over time, okay, so we've got date going through here and each of these is about a week apart and then we have a 10 centimetre sensor, so underneath the soil at 10 centimetre, underneath the soil at 20, 30, 50, 70 and 90 down, you know, down the profile. What I want to show you though, is you notice here it's, it's sort of fairly flat and then it gets into this stepping. What that stepping represents is that at night there's not much transpiration, so it's pretty flat. During the day the transpiration cuts in, so it drops. At night it's flat and during the day it, it drops in again. Okay, So the amount, the drop in that step will give us a good indication of how much transpiration the root zone is doing. Can everyone sort of see that? Yep. Okay. You'll notice at 20 centimetres that we've got a small step which is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But then we have this big rainfall event which fills up 10 centimetres. And once 10 centimetres is saturated, we start to see drainage through to 20. In a traditional sense, this is, this is about August, okay? If we knew a big rainfall was coming, in a traditional sense, a farmer would probably put nitrogen out onto their, onto their crops at about that time. But you notice here that there's bugger all transpiration for nearly one week for two weeks. Okay, so what's actually going on? And it's not until after two weeks that the soil starts to dry out a little bit, that there's some air space in there, that the roots start to get going, and again the steps get bigger and bigger and bigger as transpiration increases and increases. At some stage this will start to get smaller and smaller and flat line because it's going to run out of water. But lots of water does not necessarily lead to high transpiration. And if we're worried about nitrogen fertiliser use, what if we were to inject to here, okay? Inject on the shoulder where transpiration starts, that we have as much transpiration in those two days as we had in the whole two weeks prior to that. Okay, so can we rethink the way we actually apply nitrogen to where the conditions aren't anaerobic, so we're not going to drive nitrous oxide, and that the uptake of the plant is significant and can rip it out? We don't really have the equipment at this stage to do enough measurement on that. We can look at very simple parameters like, you know, what was the crop yield and, and the protein and make, a, make an assumption about, you know, the nitrogen use efficiency was better, but we don't have, you know, the plastic boxes that go over and measure nitrous oxide and all that sort of stuff, so we'll see how that goes. Moving right ahead, this is, this is a, a C treatment that I think is really interesting. It's, um, it's a trial that we did. Uh, over the last couple of years, and the bottom line is this, is that farmers already use seed treatments for a whole lot of things, so it's not really a new way of doing things, but the actual molecule in the treatment is exceptionally new, and what it gave us in 2009 was the highest water use efficiency out of a crop that was under a amount of dry stress, it was at Kalpara, which is a fairly sandy soil, it was pretty dry, and in 2010, at a, at a wetter site, it gave us by far the best nitrogen use efficiency. So it's overcoming the stress, or well, the, the stress that the plant's seeing, and it's been able to transpire or handle that stress a lot better. So I think that's a really interesting product, and if we can get better water use efficiency in a dry year, and better nitrogen use efficiency in a wet year, that sounds like a really good adaptation tool to a variable climate. Okay. Get on to some biochar, and I know Ron spoke about, some, uh, spoke about some biochar this morning, but I just quickly wanted to show you this is some data. We've got about five years of replicated data on, on biochar. Everything's been done with either three or four replicates. Um, most of it's been done uh, by contractors, you know, external contractors that we've hired to do, do a certain job for us so that you know, we can claim a level of independence over the data. Um, here we've got, well, we've got a whole lot of different treatments. You can see the 12 treatments. Yielding tonnes per hectare. This is out in Streaky Bay on very calcareous soil. It's about pH of 8.5 towards 9. And we've got our fertiliser input along that table and our biochar input there. 
So you can see here we have nil and nil, and we got a certain yield. We added some DAP, and we got a better yield. We added double the DAP from 35 kilos to 70 kilos, and we got a little bit more yield, but in these soils, your phosphorus is just getting tied up. Okay, so there's lots of calcium, it's alkaline conditions, calcium phosphate precipitates us out. Okay, what we found though was when we added the biochar, and so depending on the rates, we used three different rates of biochar five tonnes per hectare spread on the surface prior to sowing, then sown through, 35 kilos banded with the fertiliser, and 70, 70 kilos, oh, sorry, 175 kilos banded with the fertiliser. So 35 down with the fertiliser, 175 with the fertiliser and five tonnes across the top. The first thing I want to show is the variability of what happens because depending on what fertiliser we added and whether there was any fertiliser at all and the biochar rate, we have significant different outcomes. And this is where you've got to be really careful reading a paper on biochar that says biochar decrease yield by 20% or biochar increase yield by 30%. It's not really like that. It's about condition. So our nil treatment, where we added biochar just by itself, each one pulled down the yield significantly. Okay? Where we added biochar with fertiliser, however, in some cases we got significant increases in yield. Okay? And I just want to give you, we don't have the money to do the technical analysis of the mode of action, so this is just my broad brush approach. Think about the biochar being like a magnet and the fertiliser like a bunch of paper clips. Okay? And the soil itself, you've got your calcium there, and that's like a welder, and it'll just weld the paper clips away out of, the, out of it altogether. Okay? So when we add, add fertiliser, we'll get a bit of a response because there's some floating around escaping the welder, but a lot of them are getting welded away and they're not available to the plant. And the more we add, it doesn't really help. Okay? The actual available organic pool of phosphate is fairly limited. With a small rate of char, what I think is happening is the phosphorus is able to populate onto that char and be protected from calcium precipitation. So that your organic pool that's available to the plant is really unchanged. Okay? So you have available phosphorus there, but then at some stage later on, there's some phosphorus that can actually be combed and pulled off, like a paper coming off the magnet, by the root systems later on. And it's the ratio of that that really matters. So if you add a lot, a lot of char, it's going to stick to a lot, a lot of fertiliser. Okay? So when we have you know, really high rates, so five tonnes of biochar here with only 35 kilos of DAP, we didn't really get much response from just 35 kilos of DAP by itself. Where we had 70 kilos of DAP plus the five tonnes of biochar, we saw a significant increase. So I think what's happening is that biochar is able to carry some over. So even though it's competing, when the actual pool of phosphorus that's coming out from the fertiliser is swamping everything, it's able to grab some of that. But there's still plenty for the plant to get. Does that sort of make sense? Okay. So when you read a biochar paper, have a look of whether, for example, the biochar has already been populated. So as of about three years ago, we started doing work at looking at actually putting biochar through a phosphoric acid bath so that when we put it into the soil, it's not going to compete straight up, things like that. Um, people would have probably seen some of this work, but there's a whole lot of work about biochar in the presence of biochar seeing nitrous oxide emissions reductions. You know what I was saying before about the relative value of, in the carbon space of different things is that biochar is generally more stable than soil organic carbon, so if you were to trade biochar, you're probably not going to have as much of a reversal risk in a drought or anything like that as you would with soil organic carbon. But you've still got this 100 year liability, you've still got your accounting costs and everything else. Okay? Whereas, if you added biochar and could measure a nitrous oxide emissions reduction and or a nitrogen use efficiency improvement, why bother about the 100 year contract with the carbon on the biochar? Why not just target the nitrogen efficiency offset? Okay. Just go for the $3,000 value and not worry about that because it doesn't come with a 100-year headache and all the same levels of measurement potentially. How, how they measure nitrous oxide is still yet to be determined, of course. But anyway, maybe it's easier to measure one headache than two headaches. Um, where we're at at the moment is looking at uh, different applications of biochar in different ways and all that sort of thing, but also inoculating with twin N, which is a free-living nitrogen-fixing bacteria. 
just to see whether that can uh, help with nitrogen. Novozymes, which is a commercial product of free living phosphate mobilising bacteria, and some nutrients. What we sort of think is that in the sandy soils, is there's not many nooks and crannies for microorganisms to live in. So there's been work around showing that uh, the presence of biochar will increase, you know, for example, mycorrhizae fungi and, and other microorganisms like that. So what if we actually give these things the first go at living in the house? Someone else has to get in and kick them out. Whereas we just add the char to the soil, it's whatever else is already there that's probably going to populate it first. Will it work? Don't know. We'll see, I guess. But um, that's pretty much where we're at with that. Thank you. Um, in other work we're looking at is that in a swale system to use biochar as a filter, it does a really good job at um, collecting a whole lot of nutrients. So you can see even here the phosphate absorption compared to soils that are already treated with a high manure, soils with low manure, and then the biochar, it's sticking to a lot more phosphate. And if that char is then taken out of the swale and put onto land, particularly where you have urine patches from cows or whatever else, New Zealand work was actually published in America, but it's New Zealand work showed a 70% reduction of nitrous oxide emissions from where the char was placed um, from there. So it's protecting the waterway by collecting those nutrients, putting the organic carbon back onto the pasture, and getting an N related benefit as well. We uh, currently got a project going where we're adding biochar to uncomposted organic material, because when you have compost and you go through the composting process, gases come off. Can we have a look at actually capturing those gases onto what effectively is a carbon filter? Okay, so stuff sticks to it. And then by reducing the emissions profile of composting, we have in turn also increased the nitrogen and sulfur concentration in that product. So instead of letting nitrogen and sulfur gases go, can we get them in a product and then use that? This um, is a really, I, I think this is a fantastic technology. This precipitates. Uh, a product which is a 528 fertiliser, so 5 units of N and 28 units of phosphate out of wastewater, and wastewater with phosphate in it causes whole lots of problems, both in the environment but also in the plant. An average plant at Bolivar probably spends a million dollars a year getting this crap out of their pipes. Okay? So precipitating it out beforehand gives you a fertiliser, and it's just like a granule fertiliser, very good in terms of you know, compost and things haven't taken off in the broad acre market because their nutrient density is so low, you've got bulk handling and all this sort of stuff. Whereas with a fertiliser that's ready to go, high concentration is a 528. Um, but it's got five times less CO2 equivalents than conventional P and about 60 times less CO2 equivalents than conventional N. So that looks relatively good. As I said, it's a dry hard granule. It's distanced itself from the whole waste to food production and it's similar to DAP on a unit for unit basis. Um, it is a slower release fertiliser though. This work, most of this work on how it compares to DAP was actually done back in the 60s. So we're going to be looking at all that again this year in some different soils and see how that fertiliser goes. We think it's, um, once again, a nice little niche solution, not the be all and end all, but a nice little fit. Um, with only a few minutes to go, I'll just end there, just except to say that um, you know, there is a lot of smaller scale renewable energy products out there now. Um, when you look at Western Australia with the Mallee Oil Project, it falls over because they got such big inputs at the power station that the catchment area for biomass just gets too large and it gets killed by freight. But when you can do something on a farm scale, it just changes those dynamics altogether. So, um, and once again, the, the simplicity of selling renewable energy is just so much easier than selling carbon. So anyway, hopefully that's all right. Yes, Greg, the work which Mike McLaughlin and others did looking at phosphorus interactions on those calcareous soils actually suggested the main type came because the DAP granule didn't actually dissolve because it became coated with um, calcium dissipate within the salt water solution. Yep. So have you been able to measure that or have you looked at that risk with biochar? Uh, no, we haven't. Um, but it is a factor we've been thinking about, Dave, and when we got the crystal green, which is the precipitate fertiliser stuff, 
We actually ordered a smaller size because it's slow release and we actually want to have a smaller granule to count for surface area and stuff like that. And it also comes into our thinking with the liquid, you know, that liquid injection system as well. But um, with, the, uh, with the biochar trial, we've just used straight DAP and, and that's been about it. Yeah, simple yield measurement, basically. We're using the, we're, you are using the biochar for basically gas collection because I think that's what you're doing, isn't it? You're, you're using the porosity of the um, biochar to pick up some gases. Yeah, you're talking about in the compost? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Now, uh, that sounds comparable or similar to what you could do with zeolites. Have you ever thought of uh, use of zeolites? So zeolites are used in agriculture, actually. Um, I haven't thought about that. We're actually looking at zeolites for a different project, which is selective... It's a, a, a way of making some bio oils from, from cellulose material and using that as a molecular sieve, as, as they call it. Um, but no, I haven't looked at it in, uh, in, in agriculture per se. They, they also have the capacity to take up gases. Yep, OK. Oh, no, no, thanks for that. No, for sure. Yep. There's, there's one at the back. Yeah, mate, just shout her out or get it on mic. covered quite a few different uh, technologies there and you mentioned about carbon offsets earlier on. Um, I suppose a similar question I asked earlier on the day, what do you think of the technologies that you've covered there will people get most excited about as of 1 July next year when a carbon price kicks in? Well, firstly, um, I guess as a farming community we've got time on our side because we're not actually included in the, you know, the carbon is going to flow into farm businesses from things like fertiliser and chemical um, and so there's a bit more of a buffer there. I think, to be honest, is actually going to be coming back to return on investment. And so, for example, the seed dressings, they might not look that exciting, but as a grower, with seasonal uncertainty, they, they are probably the first sort of products I would look at. Um, things like biochar, we still have a massive shortfall in production capacity. We're looking at a plant that will make about 10,000 tonnes of biochar. But to a, to a broad acre farm, that's still a drop in the ocean. That's like one farm on the Air Peninsula at a tonne of hectare. So, you know, a lot of these things are about capacity over time. Some are going to be able to be uptaken a lot quicker. Um, there's certainly a lot of interest from our members in, in the water jet stuff. Um, but once again, that comes from hassles with rocks and stubble management and things like that. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 there's a difference. You know, you know, people talk about the difference between what's important and what's urgent. It's a bit like that, and I guess we have things that are probably going to be on a longer time scale, but like the water jet, but that's probably where some of the interest is, is things that are actually going to affect the return on investment rather than the carbon trade per se. I'd, I know there's a lot of people, well, some people certainly in New South Wales farmers that are really quite active on selling soil carbon, but we're not seeing that same level of demand. I think people here are a lot more cautious about moving forward with any of that sort of stuff. And also being on the nitrous oxide technical working group in Canberra, I just see the, the problem in trying to reconcile a dynamic organic system with a hard financial market that likes certainty. It, it's really difficult. Okay, um, it's interesting because you know we're seeing a response there that we're guessing's got to do with something to do with that magnetic cation exchange capacity, but people when they get biochar often say that you know fresh biochars have low cation exchange capacity, but that char actually was made in in February, transported and applied in April, so it wasn't it wasn't that particular char was not pre-treated anyway with any acids or or fertilizers or whatever else. And it seemed to give us a, an experience almost like claying a non-wetting sand. And, and that would suggest cation exchange. But if you actually do a reading on the chars themselves, until they start to age and you get the you know, carbonyls going to carboxylic acids and all that sort of stuff, you don't see that level of cation exchange. And so, to be honest, where I'm at with char is there is going to be differences in the feedstock that goes into char, the way it's made and all that sort of stuff. However, I think it's actually going to be more based on the, the process of how the char can be made. Like, if there's a, a process that can roll out and, say, for example, makes a 
type of renewable energy that is actually the underpinning of that business and that makes a char that's 10% not as good as the best char some dude in a lab can make, that's going to be irrelevant because this is the commercial financial situation. And I guess I'm, I'm wary of different char qualities, but at the same time the technologies that produce that char, I, I don't see a char factory in its own right. Uh, the only reason I would see char in its own right is probably not for ag, it's probably for a coking coal replacement under a carbon constrained economy because there's a lot of people who use a lot of coking coal and that's a big cost and everything else. And you can probably make char as cheap as coking coal plus you've got your carbon benefit. But in the farming sense, at the moment, the market's really dodgy and I suspect that the market's going to be driven by how you make the char and less about whether it's 10% or 20% better, the underlying economics of the plant. That sort of answered the question in a roundabout way? Yeah. No worries. And just on char, I'd also like to thank everyone at uh, Sorrow at Wait who's given us uh, a lot of technical support.